Insights in Business. I'm Mary Ruth Snyder, the Executive Director for the Campbell River and District Chamber of Commerce. Our guest today is Mr. Brian Kinzett from the BC Salmon Farmers. He is their brand new Executive Director and boy did he pick a time to join that organization. <laughs> Brian, how long have you been in that role? So I've now been in that role since January 1st, but I actually joined the association a couple of years ago as their science and policy expert. So okay, because that's your background. That right? is my background. Okay, so let's go back to the very beginning. Where were you born and raised? Uh, so I'm originally from Penticton. I was a third generation tree fruit farmer. Oh, okay. um, and uh, so I sort of grew up in an agricultural background. Uh, came down to the island in 1982 to, uh, I'd watched too many Jack Cousteau specials and came down to become a marine biologist and uh, did my first degree at the University of Victoria. And oh, okay. during that time I, I uh, uh, learned about aquaculture and sort of the farming of the ocean and realized that, you know, both my heritage and my marine biology could, could coexist and I've sort of been on that pathway ever since. And, um, I've subsequently done a graduate degree in marine biology at Simon Fraser, and then during COVID, for something to different, I actually did an online MBA. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and what was that in? Uh, in business. In business. Yeah. Okay. And so I've sort of always been at this sort of interface of um, marine biology and science and business in, in my career. So okay. I've been about in agriculture for about 35 years now. Wow. What's your favorite part? Uh, first and foremost, the people. Mm -hmm. uh, People in the ag culture industry tend to be very passionate about what they're doing. Uh, we tend to all be people that are in love with the ocean uh, or love with fish or, you know, the whole, the environment in which we work. I think that's a general consensus across the whole thing. Um, and I think in many cases, uh, people like myself that really sort of see this as a way of um, how we're going to ach achieve global issues about, about how we're going to um, find enough seafood in a growing population um, when when basically already half of the seafood we eat is actually coming from some sort of farming either in freshwater or the ocean. Okay. Now when you were growing up in Penticton what experiences from your childhood or your teenage years sort of help to inform your choices that you're still making today? Mm. Uh, well, probably the first one on marine biology is, is running joke with my family that they couldn't take me anywhere without finding me up to my knees in whatever water body <laughs> was around, and that sort of pointed me very much in the you know that I was destined for something to do with marine biology. And do you remember catching your first fish? Yes, as a matter of fact, yeah, Shoot Lake, um, yeah, with my father, and then went on to do a lot of trout fishing as a as a as in my youth and teenage years. Where's Shoot Lake? Uh, just uh, just above Naramata in the Okanagan Valley. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, so, do you prefer the lake fishing over ocean fishing? Well, I'm very much an ocean person now. So I've yeah. yeah came down yeah. So I've never really got down to the ocean and been on Vancouver Island since 1982 and have never looked back. And oh, yeah. okay. Um, now, working in marine biology, were you working in like? in a government position or were you working, like what was your path after? So I've done a lot of paths. Uh, I worked uh, for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Okay. I was in a, at the Biological Station in Nanaimo for I think about seven years. I did my master's degree in scallop aquaculture at that time. Uh, then I went on to work as a consultant for a long time. I uh, had my own oyster farm for about a decade. Uh, I've worked on various projects, including um, the Canadian International Development Agency. Um, I've worked in Brazil, Indonesia, travel the Europe, um, sort of uh, Australia, New Zealand, sort of on various other work trips or talk speaking trips. Been through northern China, um, China a couple times on work wow. trips. Worked in the U.S. Yeah. Now, when they talk about the aquaculture market. Um, is China a big market for aquaculture? So China is the largest producer of aquaculture products in the world. 
Really? Um, yeah, um, millions of tons um, basically dominate everything else. But what is really significant there is that uh, China has recently gone from being a net exporter of seafood products to a net importer as they have basically the largest growing middle class in the world. And one of the things that happens when we help people out of poverty is the first thing that they do is they really up their seafood consumption as, as a nation. Um, and so we're now actually seeing where we're actually competing with China for a lot of our seafood products. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, when people think of aquaculture, like you are the CEO of the BC mm. Salmon Farmers, but aquaculture is much bigger than just salmon farming. So can you help to educate us as to what aquaculture uh, actually entails? So aquaculture is anything to do with the farming of um, plants or, or uh, animals, uh, fish or mollusks like bivalves. Uh, in fresh water, uh, brackish water, or salt water. So it takes many different forms. It includes everything from microcellular uh, individual algae to big kelps, um, oysters, snails, uh, reptiles in some areas, um, uh, and then a whole uh, vast array of def different types of fish in both fresh water and salt water. And of course, probably globally, um, farm salmon are sort of becoming, you know, sort of the, the chicken of the sea as far as aquaculture production. It's a very high value product. It's very nutritious. It's, um, the technology is, is, be, is advancing rapidly. And so we see that around the world now in cold water areas like us. Now, you mentioned plants. Can you give us an example of plant life that you're growing? Or that's um, sir, there's, it's, there's an emerging market. There's always been a small amount of kelp aquaculture on Vancouver Island, but okay. globally, um, uh, millions of tons of, of, of sea plants, uh, mostly kelps, mostly in Indonesia and China are grown and for a variety of uses. Um, they go from very low value used for fertilizers or, or feed crops to very high value ones um, that are used for special nutri nutri nutritional chemicals or other uh, products. The, oh, the okay. agar that is in your ice cream that makes it gel, that's actually from farm seaweed, probably in really? Indonesia. Yeah, so I never knew what agar was. Yeah, so that is, yeah, so <laughs> gelling agents. So okay. there's, this is a wide variety of things. And as we, as the, the sector advances globally, we're seeing more and more things being farmed. The reality, the reality is, as we approach 10 billion people in 2050, which is expected to hit, is that we need a whole nother second Earth's oceans to provide the amount of seafood that we're going to consume. And so we can't get more than about 100 million metric tons of seafood for about the last, I think it's about 20 years now, global seafood production is really maxed out. So the only way we can get more seafood uh, is to farm it. And so this is both a way to uh, provide economies, provide more healthy food, but also a way to take pressure off what's really an overly stressed ocean, you know, in the bigger scheme. Right. So in the 35 years that you've been in this field, what's been the most shocking thing you've experienced? Mm. I think the main one is has been that as the difficulty that any new natural resource sector has in, in British Columbia and actually in really the urbanized world or Western world is that anytime we try and introduce a new industry, um, it's held to very much higher standards than what we would call a traditional industry. And then there's this whole question about how long does an industry have to be on the coast before it's accepted or seen as traditional. And certainly that's one that um, the salmon farming sector has been going through. It really only started here in the mid 80s. Um, grew, grew very, sort of, has had a number of fits and starts. It was brand new. People are trying to figure it out. But what we've had is, um, we originally started with a, a campaign out of Alaska to demarket um, farm salmon in BC because it was seen as a threat to the Alaska salmon. That certainly hasn't been the case because, you know, the demand just continues to grow and grow. But what it has done is has led to a, a very strong um, activist campaigns that are trying to link farm salmon with uh, the demise of wild salmon. Okay. And so as a marine biologist, what is your response to that from a scientific point of view? Well, so there's a number of interesting things. So one is, you know, we have to start back the fact that we really overfish our fisheries. 
right? We've also had a major amount of habitat loss in the freshwater. We've seen things like there's been so much logging in the upper Fraser that tree cover has gone enough that waters are simply, you know, in a lot of cases, we have warm summers are just too warm. So there's that, the sort of the, the local effects are overfishing, habitat loss, pollution. Okay. Um, but in the global scale, one of the things that we don't actually, most people aren't aware of, is there's actually more salmon in the North Pacific Basin than there has been in a century. Oh. Uh, and that's a surprise to almost anyone. It was a real surprise to me when um, uh, Richard Beamish, uh, you know, Order of Canada, very respected re retirement fishery science, who'd just been publishing on this, sort of talked about that. So what really seems to be the big driver now, um, and there's, you know, it's a death of a thousand cuts, but it is really climate change, right? So we've had okay. uh, this phenomenon where we had very warm water over the last few years in the North Pacific and it had been warming. We were oceanographers. Um, called the blob um, and we have another thing where um, both Russia and Alaska do this thing called ocean ranching where they use the exact same net pens that we use in British Columbia but they they take fish out of hatcheries they raise them to a much larger size so they are over a threshold at which they think there will be high mortality and then they release them and they release billions of chum, chum and pink salmon and those then compete with wild salmon in the North Pacific and then come back to, a, to what they call a terminal fishery. Um, so they catch oh, them when okay. they re-enter the river mouth. So that's why you call it ranching. So it's really just, okay. it's really just salmon farming taking advantage of it, um, um, where you let go of your fish and catch them when they come home. But what's happening in that, and this fluctuates from year to year uh, with sort of standard oceanographic uh, changes, mm -hmm. but is that we now are seeing sockeye salmon that they compete with um, and other species coming back smaller and smaller. So even though there's been record runs in, in the Bristol Bay up in the Bering Sea, um, the salmon are getting smaller and smaller if there's just more of them. And so what, what an emerging consensus seems to be is that we may have actually hit carrying capacity of the North Pacific through this ocean ranching. Um, and so what it means is it's like the equivalent of putting uh, you know, 50 cows in a pasture that can really only support 25 cows, right? right. None of the cows are going to grow as big. Okay. The other part of that equation, and this is very complex, is that climate change is pushing salmon north. Right. Um, so we see that salmon are no sh now showing coming up rivers in the Arctic where they were never seen before. Oh, okay. And so the problems that we talk about in British Columbia with declines in wild salmon and the closures and um, well, those things are ha those same things are happening in lots of areas where there are not salmon farms. So um, okay. California this year, Oregon, Washington are all having dr drastic. Um, cutbacks in their fisheries. Um, Southeast Alaska is having um, uh, significant fisheries closures. Uh, Japan has had exactly this, their declines in salmon mirror exactly ours. So unfortunately, to come back to your very original question about the most shocking thing is that, is that um, I represent a sector that is largely being scapegoated for, for one issue. Uh, we're working very hard to improve our transparency that we are not in a f uh, significant effect on wild salmon. Right. But the issues that are at hand are very, very complex. So it's very easy to choose a villain, right? And, right. and hold someone up as a villain. And that doesn't help any of us. And it certainly doesn't help the scientific debate. Now, the whole thing about the ranching that Alaska and Russia are doing, that's the first time I've heard that term. And that's um, the other question that I've always had in my mind, like people talk about a decline in the wild salmon stocks. It's like, well, wait a second, before they get to us, they got to go through the Alaska waters and all of the overfishing that's happening out in the international waters. Is that impacting the amount of salmon that actually come back? Yeah, and all of these have impacts. So that's right. that was one, you know, in the 80s, there was a big push because the Japanese and Chinese had open uh, gill nets, you know, mass, these massive gill net fisheries in the open ocean, catching a lot of BC salmon. Now there's a lot of concern. I'm not sure how valid it is, um, but there's... Uh, there's certainly some evidence that is showing that there's um, a lot of Alaska interception of salmon that are, that are coming down the Alaska Panhandle, um, uh, the Destin for the Skeena River down further south. Of course, um, we catch a lot of Columbia River salmon, so um, they're destined for the Columbia. So, you know, there's interception happening all over, but that is certainly something that we're concerned about. Um, there's a very interesting court case this year um, over killer whales in the in the Strait of Georgia that is actually a affecting a, a uh, troller fishery in Alaska thinking that 
there that's actually intercepting large Chinook salmon that are actually oh, okay. destined for Puget Sound and southern Vancouver Island that are an important food for killer whales. Right. Okay. So there's lots of emotion um, yeah. about everything to do with salmon. Salmon are totemic um, and an iconic species here in British Columbia and we mm -hmm. all share that and certainly um, you know that we talked about things I like well the people that I work with are all salmon crazy right that's why they're in the industry and right. and so we all feel very strongly about you know wild salmon and some of us you know feel very strongly about farm salmon as well in a positive light. Now um, what is the current state like has the DFO of Kent the Def Department of Fisheries and Oceans DFO in Canada, have they announced what the um, state is for fisheries right, like for the next couple of months for this year? Um, I'm not sh completely sure on that. I know that okay. there's starting to be announcements coming out about Fraser River Fisheries. Probably a lot of those will come out further closer to when, you know, as test fisheries go, what the, what the quotas are going to be. Um, there's certainly been a lot of restrictions. Um, interestingly, you know, some of the local escapements or the amount of fish that, that um, uh, escape fisheries essentially to go up, right. up uh, streams, you know, for example, here in Campbell River have actually been doing quite well. We've had some right, really positive runs and that's probably a lot to do with some of the enhancement of habitat that's been happening by community groups in, in the area. Okay. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll see what's going to happen this year. So to counter the most shocking thing, what's been the most encouraging thing you've witnessed over the last 35 years? I think the innovation. Okay. We've gone from, I had my very, I was telling you a story the other day, I had my very first experience in aquaculture. Um, I was working as a, a diver in probably about 1984, I was probably 21. And I was sent out to uh, retrieve some uh, dive shop that I worked for, sent me out to retrieve some sunk blocks off a salmon farm in Sydney back before we, anyone really knew what they were doing. At that time, the pens were about 20 feet in diameter, or actually 20 feet square. They were made out of logs and wood and, and some you know, old net they'd probably taken from a fishery. Um, there was no safety standards. I almost died. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> Wait a second. Let's go back to that part. How did you almost die? Um, well, we got me, so yeah, funny story. So me and my my uh, my friend get my roommate, you know, cause we show up at this salmon farm and and uh, we were asked to go down between two layers of nets and and so we didn't think anything went down and we immediately got hooked up on the nets and he was I was here and he was there and we were both hooked at each other wondering how we were going to get each other um, uh, unhooked and. I, ironically, when I was telling a story the other day, I, as I was hooked against the net, I was staring into the pen where all the salmon were, and I was watching these beautiful salmon swim by and thinking, oh, that looks really cool. You can actually farm these guys, right? So that was actually my very first introduction to aquaculture. Uh, we managed to unhook ourselves and climb out and collect whatever <laughs> cash money we were getting as 20-year-olds and, and carried on. And, and he went on to become a very well-known salmon farm manager uh, and okay. spent his whole career in the industry as well. Uh, but I think the, you know, so now what we're talking about is we have these very large farms where the salmon occupy maybe 1% of the water. So we have really great fish welfare. Uh, we have things going into the industry now that are using artificial intelligence. For example, one of our members uh, out of um, California manufactures a camera that uses artificial intelligence. So every time a, a salmon swims by that camera, the camera and the computer behind it records all the spots as if it was reading a barcode. And then it mm. also can measure that, that fish. It can look whether or not that fish has um, any fish health issues um, and reports those out. So, every, so I think last time I checked with um, the owner, uh, they had taken 600 million fish through their entire life cycles and using artificial intelligence so it's learning all the time wow. and so now instead of having to look for you know so we have veterinarians on every farm right and so those veterinarians would classically you know if they thought there was a fish that had a fish health issue they would treat the population now we're getting to the point where now they can look at individual fish they can measure those wow. all out without handling them okay. We have all sorts of, you know, we've replaced, we've had a 90% reduction um, in antibiotics. We almost use no antibiotics anymore, probably less than any agricultural industry right now because of vaccine development. Right. Um, we just have all these amazing technologies coming down the pipe, you know, and we're sort of reflecting what we call agriculture 2.0 or 3.0, this sort of smart farming. Okay. And so that's really coming down into, into our sector in a really big way. And, and 
a salmon farm now doesn't look anything at all in its operations from what it did um, 10 years ago and probably another 10 years ago from now they'll look completely different again so but will it be here well that is the big question so you know we had um, uh, in 2019, uh, the Liberal government, during their mandate letters, um, or collection platforms, said that by 2025 they would transition the industry away from open net, pen, net culture. That was despite the fact that we'd had the $37 million Cohen Commission in 2012, and probably by that time probably another seven um, Canadian Science Advisory Secretariat major panels reviewing science that all said we, were, we as a sector had minimal risk to wild salmon. Right. Um, and but uh, we have, as I mentioned earlier, we have campaigners that are uh, very passionate that we have an impact on wild salmon and have been lobbying to get us basically out of the water. So let's talk about the most recent history that most of the audience would probably somewhat remember. So December 17th, 2020, uh, uh, Bernadette Jordan, who was the minister of yep. DFO at that point, uh, made the announcement just before Christmas, I believe it was a Thursday, that said everybody's going to be out of the water by 2025. Yep, so they started this process, we'd be out of 2025, and then the December one you did was that we would, the Department Discovery, of Fish and Oceans right. would not renew the License. farms in Discovery Islands region. Right. And uh, that decision um, resulted in about a 24% reduction or about 20 million meals a year is yeah. really what that re results to and about 1500 jobs basically here in the Campbell River area. Right. Uh, that decision the companies felt that they had not been consulted, that the minister had ignored her department's own science um, and requested a judicial review of that decision. Okay. Uh, last year, a judge, I'm getting, it's been such a blur, uh, I think it was last it year, a judge came down and said, and overturned that decision and said that the minister had not properly cons consulted First Nations, had not properly consulted the industry, had ignored science, had even made, within the days leading up to it, in internal documents kept changing the reason why they were doing it. It was clearly a political Correct. decision. Yes, so l let's just over, let's provide a little bit of overview. Yep. So the reason that uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau made that announcement on the campaign trail in 2020 was so that he would win the seat in Vancouver, which he ultimately did win. And that was his sole motivation for doing that because it wasn't anything about science. And the other thing that he was elected on was that he was going to ensure nation-to-nation -nation consultation between the Canadian government and every First Nation in Canada, there's 686 of them. And that, over the last three years, since that announcement, has not happened. Yes, so again, I'll try and put it very shortly. So during the period, you know, recent years, um, starting back as far as 25 years ago, First Nations on Vancouver Island and in the Central Coast have become uh, involved in, uh, in the sector. Okay. Uh, there are some First Nations that have not wanted the sound farming in their territory. Sound farming went in before consultation with First Nations existed or befo before uh, BC and Canada uh, accepted the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. Right. So in some areas like the Broughton Archipelago, we've had a respectful transformation process where the First Nations um, agreed that we would phase out of that area. Right. In other areas, such as the Guasla and and I can't, and Quatsino or the Kitasu Heihei, and I can't speak for First Nations, but we've had very positive relationships develop. Um, and, in the, and in some cases, um, like the Kitasu Heihei, they've now been farming in partnership with Marine Harvest and now Moe for over 25 years. Right. And that's a community of about 500 people. Yeah. Um, one in every two households now works in the agriculture sector. Uh, they now have their own smokehouse that takes farm salmon and they sell that under an indigenous brand and they've been uh, across Walmart in Canada and are now about to uh, um, expand into the U.S. We put about, we generate about $180 million a year in First Nation communities yeah. um, through jobs, through providing opportunities to be on the supply and service sector. Right. For example, in Port Hardy, the First Nation there owns a feed barge that you know supplies others 
um, are involved in fish transporting right. uh, or um, net cleaning and, and you know supply side on the industry and we have a very large uh, supply side to the industry here. So um, recently um, I had the opportunity to be in uh, meetings with all three companies, Cermak, mm -hmm. Maui and um, Greek. Greek. Yeah, Greek. And basically they said up to this point right now they've lost 40% yes. of their foothold in British Columbia. Yeah. And they're getting very close to the tipping point. And when they're gone, they're gone. They're not coming back. Now we don't want to see that because they contribute over a billion dollars, that's billion with a B, to the BC economy. Yeah. And so the where is that, if they go, where is that billion dollars going to come for our economy? If we lose that, we're going to lose hospitals and schools and the list is endless. So, so prior to, yeah. prior to uh, 2020, we were generating about $1.6 billion in economic activity, primarily focused from Campbell River North and actually a good foothold in the lower mainland as well. Right. Um, and yeah, employed about processing plants. In processing Surrey. plants, yeah. uh, feed, feed processing, yeah. uh, other supply side, trucking. Turns out we've, we're now, at one point, we're the, I think the number two or number three commercial carrier on BC ferries. We are the largest ag cultural export in British Columbia and we're the largest employer from Campbell River North right. and frankly there is no other sector that is going to come on to Vancouver Island and provide these kind of jobs Correct. right we pay about 30 percent more than the median starting wage I believe last time I checked the median the average starting wage was about eighty thousand dollars a year so these are actually jobs that pay enough that people can actually think about buying a house or starting a family. So for, you know, right. northern communities like Port McNeil and Port Hardy, it's actually pulling young people back to the communities. Right. right. And so uh, commercial fishing across all species is down. We don't expect it to come back in any way. Many of the licenses have moved to the lower mainland. Right. Uh, uh, mining and logging is down. Yeah. And tourism is really only seasonal. And it's also, you know, we saw that impact during COVID where you know, actually, it, you know, it doesn't, yeah. a, a shock to that industry really affects tourism. Yeah. So we're really proud of the fact of what the economic impact we have on the island. And, and not only that, what we're doing with reconciliation with First Nation communities. We've right. all committed as a sector to reconciliation, um, that we won't farm where First Nations don't want us, and we right. will work where First Nations do want us and want right. to partner. So. So we are at a crossroads and we're also out of time. <laughs> so yeah. the crossroads is that we are still waiting on Minister Murray and the Prime Minister to announce what the transition plan is going to be. So we will have to have you come back in the fall after mm -hmm. all of those things are in place to talk about what the end result is going to be, not only locally, but what that means for the province. Yeah. So. Um, Brian, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you for having um, me. And for providing the background around the science and where things have grown and how things have evolved. And um, I and we're at a in a holding pattern until they bring out the transition plan. Yeah, we're, we're spending a lot of time participating and engaging with the federal government on this and okay. talking to government. Uh, we're working very hard to make sure we protect all those jobs on Vancouver Island here and in yeah. Lower Mainland. Uh, and we'll wait to see what's going to be announced. And okay. uh, we, you know, we're hoping to have that we'll see some positive things that will allow us to continue to innovate and provide that trust and transparency that the public wants. Okay, that's great. So we can get you back in the fall. Anytime. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you so much. You have been watching Insights and Business. Our guest today was Brian Kingsit from BC Salmon Farmers. Please join us again. Oh, oh, oh.